How you doing, everybody? Uh, it is Francis here. Hopefully, you're all hearing me. Are you guys hearing me here? Okay. I can see that my microphone is jumping up and down a little bit, so uh, hopefully you're all hearing me. This is one of the first couple of lives that I've done, so uh, hopefully it's going to uh, work out some kinks here. Um, but we've got the chat live. Uh, you're going to have me, and we are discussing uh, the book Roadside Picnic. Um, Ro th this is a book that kind of came out of left field for me. I was not expecting to uh, really enjoy this book as much as I did. Um, I'd always heard good things about it, but like it's <sighs> okay. So me and me and Russian literature. Uh, let's just let's just start there. I don't have a whole lot of experience with with Russian literature uh, to you know to really get into it. Um, well, I'm going to try to make a couple of adjustments here. Make sure that my yeah everything's coming through. Okay, we're good. I assume somebody would tell me if they couldn't hear me, but we'll we'll check it out later. Anyway, Roadside Picnic um, by the by a couple of brothers. Of course, Jesus Christ, I can fucking get myself put together here. All right, there, there, there we go. Okay, uh, Arkady and Boris. Uh, Dragatsky, uh, written in 1971. Uh, so Soviet, uh, good, good old fashioned Soviet literature. Um, so I mentioned, uh, me and Soviet literature earlier on. Um, I, I have very limited, uh, experience with Soviet literature, but, uh, I do have a little bit like of, of, of newer stuff. Um, the night watch series, um, you know, so it's, and and one thing that I notice uh, about Soviets is, uh, or Russian Russian literature. I don't want to just you know lump it in the Soviets, but at some point in time there has to be like a scene where everybody's getting, where two people are just getting absolutely shit faced and discussing philosophy, which uh, you know. So so anyway, uh, the way that uh, Roadside Picnic goes, uh, we're following our hero Red. He's what's known as a stalker. Uh, the stalkers are people who go into these zones. So uh, the book starts like 13 years after a, uh, they just call it the visitation, the visit. Um, aliens showed up. Nobody saw them show up. Nobody saw them la leave, but we know that they showed up and they landed in these six areas and they created these zones and then they just fucked off. Um, and that's it. Like, there's nothing really that's said about the aliens beyond they were here and now they're not here. And this is just the detritus that they left behind. So they, uh, we go through the, the stalkers are the ones who go into the zone, um, illegally. They go into the zones illegally and steal junk and sell it on the black market. Um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, stuff that's inside of these, uh, inside of these zones that nobody really knows what they do. And they, you know, they bring it out and they all would all get studied by scientists and everything. So, um, you know, when they're bringing out batteries, they bring out things that they call empties. Don't really know what empties are, but they have like names. They have, you know, sparklers. They have uh, was dancing dish rags or something. There, there's all kinds of uh, names that they have for a lot of these things, but they don't really go too far into them. I know some of it's used as uh, as jewelry, though, at some point. Um, so it's, you know, the, the stalkers going in. Um, Red is a, um, let's see, I just want to make sure. Yeah, Redrick is a, um, now this is all taking place in Canada, but it's still very, very Russian and very Soviet. But uh, Red, you know, is somebody who goes in, steals stuff, but he also works at a, um, a nearby laboratory. So the laboratory sends people into the zone, but they send them in like um, in, in, in you know, smarter ways. They send in robots. They're, they're testing all kinds of things to do it so that you won't die in the zone because people die in the zone constantly. Um, there's this stuff called hell slime that at one point, one guy touches hell slime and the bones inside of his legs dissolve. Like the legs are fine. Just the bones are completely gone. Uh, there's these huge gravity wells that, that suck people in. Um, there's just all kinds of things. And basically stalkers go in, they, they do it until they die. Uh, Red is one of the very few ones that manages to survive, but he's also working at the Institute. 
And the thing is, though, is that working in a regular place does not, you know, working a regular job uh, as a laboratory assistant does not make you as good of money as being a stalker. You can survive. You can certainly like, you know, uh, continue doing what you're doing, but going in, stealing stuff and then bringing it out and selling it on the black market, that's where the money's at. So, uh, you know, he's going in and, um, you know, they're, they're young and, you know, young, dumb and full of cum, as you might, uh, as you want to say it, uh, going in and coming out. Uh, let's see. So, uh, section one, um, it's, it's broken, not really into chapters, but there's five sections and each, each are like different sections of Red's life as we, as we follow him through. So, uh, you know, Redrick, uh, is going in and, uh, one of his, one of the lab assistants dies while he's in and he blames himself and everything. Um, and then at the very end of it, his girlfriend comes to him and she's like, Oh, I'm pregnant. And, which is a very concerning thing for them because uh, stalkers have a high birth mutation rate um, because they keep going into these zones full of fucked up stuff. So uh, section two skips forward a little bit. Um, and this is where uh, we meet. Red is with uh, another stalker named Burbage. Burbage is the one who uh, touches this hell slime and his uh, leg bones dissolve. Uh, Red drags him out. Um, we also meet Red's daughter, which he calls Monkey, uh, who was born with all black eyes and light fur all over her body, um, but seems normal in, in any other way. Um, and so then Red meets up with a, uh, uh, a client who he's selling things to, and the client's like, I want to get some hell slime. And he's like, fuck no, I don't bring that stuff out, but that he does have some. Uh, but he ends up uh, getting, getting hemmed up by the cops and going to jail. They do find the hell slime, they sell it, and uh, the hell slime is what is used to um, save, to take care of his wife and kid. Uh, section three goes into um, a little bit later. Um, one of his, one of his old in, Redrick's old institute friends um, is, you know, following up because he thinks that they've stopped stalkers from going in. Turns out stalkers are still going in. Uh, they find out it's because of this vulture guy. Vulture is like a dude who doesn't give a fuck whatsoever um, and is just there for the money and will leave people behind all the time in the zone. Um, Redrick gets out of jail. He spends like two years in jail. He gets out, um, gets drunk. Uh, and then we, uh, during one of the monologues in there, we get the discussion of why this book is called roadside picnic, which we'll get into. And then section four is Redrick doing one last, uh, uh, one last push into to the zone to find, uh, something called the golden sphere, which supposedly grants any wish that you have. Uh, and then, you know, them finding that and, and how that ends. So there's, I was, I was like, really like, um, surprised there's not a whole lot of politics in it. Um, there's a lot of philosophy to it. And I read, you know, after I read a book like this, I like to go and read what other people have to say about it and, uh, you know, what they, uh, what they gleaned from it. Um, some of it was a little weird. Like I, I realized that this is like a Soviet book. And so anytime, you know, anytime somebody writes something from behind the iron curtain, you know, there's just this, oh, well, you know, they're obviously writing like this person was just like the things they found in the zone were these like, you know, crazy unknown things that were forbidden, like blue jeans from America, which didn't really seem that wasn't the, that wasn't what I got from, from it. Um, you know, it just represented that like, you know, how far ahead these, these aliens were. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, they discuss that because there, you know, there is that the, the philosophical that we, we get into it, whereas they're like, why is it that we are, um, why, why is it that this, um, you know, these aliens just showed up and left. And for the most part, red doesn't want to discuss. He doesn't care. He just goes in, does what he does and gets the money because that's what takes care of him and his family. He's a worker and he's got to work. But, uh, you know, they, they finally do have, you know, the discussion and it's not a, um, necessarily what happens if the aliens come back. Cause they're really not concerned about the aliens coming back. Uh, and, and here's why. So here's, here's, uh, the, the quote, a picnic picture, a forest, a country road, a meadow, Cars drive off the country road into the meadow. A group of young people get out carrying bottles, baskets of foods, transistor radios, and cameras. They light fires, pitch tents, turn on the music. In the morning, they leave. The animals, birds, and insects that watched in horror through the long night creep out of their hiding places. And what do they see? 
old spark plugs and old filters strewn around, rags, burnt out bulbs, and monkey wrenches left behind. And of course, the usual mess, apple cores, candy wrappers, charred remains of the campfire, cans, bottles, somebody's handkerchief, somebody's pen knife, torn newspapers, coins, faded uh, flowers picked in another meadow. Um, and then it goes on to say, you know, what if we were just like a roadside picnic for these aliens? You know, there's no rhyme or reason for them to be here. They just saw us as nothing that needed to be concerned about. They stopped off, did whatever they did, and then they fucked off again. And that is, you know, that that's that is part of the uh, the the philosophical discussion that they're getting into here. But I mean, this is really the only time that we talk about it. You know, and the the overall arching uh, the overarching philosophy of it is about you know how does one make oneself happy? I think. You know, feel free if anybody's read this to jump into the into the chat and talk about it because you know a lot of this is I've read it once and I, I was kind of like pulling, you know, it's it's a translation of a Russian book, so it's uh it it's it's confusing. Um, it's a culture that I don't know and I don't understand. Um, you know, so there the the science fiction is is a little off for me. Um, but it does like any like I said, really any other Russian like science fiction that I've read is very much like this, where it is uh, kind of it's it's more it's more about the people, I suppose, than it is about the science, um, which is what I really like about it. Um, you know, just a lot of um, you know the humanity, the philosophy of humanity. So we have an alien speed race here that is you know possibly millennia in far ahead of us, you know, which is a, a, a kind of a, you know, I guess it's not really a new concept, but in the seventies, it kind of was, you know, um, a lot of science fiction up until then was being written about, you know, uh, aliens that were either, you know, if you think of the uh, um, Starship Troopers, you know, kind of on par, like, and, and I mean, Starship Troopers, the, the book, not the movie, because the book had, you know, uh, an actual, like, um, humanoid uh, alien element to it as well, not just the the mindless drones of bugs, um, but you know there there is always this like well they they're like us they have these cities and the cities look weird and maybe the rivers look weird and maybe this that and the other thing but still like you know there's a water purification plant over there there's houses this is place looks like a place of worship and we have a uh, uh, a book here that's going completely off the rails off away from all of that not doing anything to do with, uh, with, with an alien that you can talk to and that you can understand. Um, even, even in, um, the old man series, the, uh, if you've, if you've read that, there's a, um, there's a race in there called, uh, the, the Kansu, I think is how you pronounce it. And they are uh, a race that is like massively far ahead of every other race. But when they go to war, they don't go to war to, to win, um, because, you know, cause they could hit a button and annihilate everybody, you know, they go to war, be they, they have like for such an advanced species, they have a very like medieval barbaric, you know, look into, um, uh, into battle. So, you know, their thing is like, we are going to dumb ourselves down to make it a fair fight. And if we're going to win, it's because we bested you at your level rather than besting you at our level. So again, that's still, but there's still communication that happens between those two. Like they're advanced, but like technologically advanced, not really like on a completely different plane of existence. These aliens, they have nothing like they are, they are merely not even a backdrop. They are merely a catalyst for the rest of, uh, of what we're going to talk about here. So the, you know, the entirety of rhetoric going from uh, being a young stalker in his early twenties to, you know, being older with a wife and kid and, you know, trying to, 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 to figure out, you know, what he's, you know, like I said, what is he going to do to take care of his family? We have, while they were in, while uh, he and um, the vulture were in the, uh, where, where the vulture lost his leg bones, vulture was like, let, you know, bring me out. I know where the golden sphere is, blah, blah, blah. I'll draw, draw you a map and I'll t teach you how to get there. And, you know, Red's just like, fuck it. I'm, you know, I'll get him out regardless. Cause you know, you don't leave rhetoric has a very like you don't leave anybody behind even though like while he's doing it there's all this inner monologue going on it's like fuck this guy he would leave me behind in the heartbeat why am i why am i doing this for him so he brings him out and as the years go you know like i said uh red spends a little time in jail but um 
Vulture ends up becoming incredibly wealthy, mostly because he's sending other people into the um, into the zones to pull stuff out, and then he's the one who's who's the fence for all of it. So um, eventually, uh, Red and and um, uh, Vulture they the last one that they're doing. Red takes um, one of Vulture's sons into uh, into the zone. He's taking the kid into the zone. And he's walking him through everything and getting like, you know, it's very harrowing. Just like, you know, you got to dip underneath here and go under this, like in this like muddy slime or whatever, because lightning bolts are going off. There's these gravity wells that you have to get around. There's like this incredibly like they have to get down because there's just like really hot. Like, you know, it feels like they're like an oven passes above them. Like I don't and like none of this stuff makes sense. There's no rhyme or reason for any of it. And, uh, you know, they're, again, they are just obstacles in the way of the actual humanity that we're, that, that we are trying to discuss. So as they're going, um, red realizes and he understands that, um, uh, the, the vulture son has to be a, um, uh, a sacrifice. So there's a, a device, there's something called the meat grinder, which, uh, has to, somebody has to die in the meat grinder for you to be able to get to the uh the sphere at the end um and so the kid is you know he kind of just like oh you know he runs he's he's running towards the sphere and it's like you know happiness for everybody happiness for everybody gets caught up in the meat grinder for you know twisted like a wet rag is how it's described and uh so then like the last couple of pages are are redrick having that like that internal discussion because his greatest wish is for his daughter to be normal uh, because his daughter has turned into more and more into an actual monkey, like, and has completely lost all of her humanity and all of her intelligence. And there's, uh, there's a lot of the, you know, um, at, at some point the dead, like cemeteries inside of the zone, the dead start rising and going home. They're not, you know, dangerous or anything, but, uh, rhetoric's dad is one of them. And, you know, he just slowly is like, yeah, put vodka in front of him. He'll get to it eventually. And like, you know, slowly but surely the dad is like, you know, reaching towards the, the glass of vodka while the conversation's happening. So there's all these elements of like how they're, they're, you know, interacting with the zone strips you of your, human of your humanity in some way or another, like whether it's the dead rising or, you know, your, your offspring being, you know, completely like turning into a monkey for some insane reason. So that's when Redrick like kind of comes across, you know, he, he has the mental realization that it's not about, you know, his happiness. Um, his happiness is something that is completely useless. It's about the happiness of everybody. So it ends with him uh, shouting the same wish, you know, happiness for everybody, no matter what. Um, and then it ends there. It doesn't say whether or not everybody gets happiness. It's very weird that they're, that, that anybody is kind of going towards there. There there's an orb that grants wishes because that's very like uh, Aladdin, uh, Aladdin's lamp kind of thing. I don't know what, um, and, and again, you don't know what happens at the end. So there's nothing, um, there, there, there's nothing you know, say to say like, you know, here's, uh, here's how it all ended. And then everything was great. Redrick may have died. He may have leaned, he may have touched the, the golden orb and then been turned into ash. Who knows? Um, the, the fun of philosophical books, you get to, you know, decide how it ends on your own. Um, and honestly, I think that it, it ended in a, uh, in a really great place there. Um, so it was, I, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take too long to get through. Uh, and it's, uh, it's simple, but complicated where it needs to be. And it's the kind of science fiction that I really like where it's, like the, and I don't want to say hard sci-fi because what hard sci-fi means is like the physics of space are like, you know, the physics of real world of the real world are the physics and like the, I don't want any of that. When I say hard science fiction, I mean, here we are in spaceships and different planets doing planet stuff and doing spaceship stuff. Um, I like the ones as like science fiction being used to, to discuss humanity. Uh, you see it done here. You see it done in, um, you know, Star Trek does it, even though Star Trek is very in space. Um, Star Trek deals with humanity because that is what the majority of the Federation, at least the Federation that we deal with, um, is, uh, so, um, you know, overall the, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a fun romp, I guess I can say. Uh, but also it's just, um, it's a book that really, uh, 
that really kind of came out of left field for me. Like I kind of read up a little bit. I had a little idea of what I was going into, but overall it's a book that um, it's a book that I don't, that I haven't read since um, annihilation is kind of like it. Uh, if you, if you read those books, cause there's kind of a zone there and people go in there and they, you know, lose their humanity and they're changed. But, uh, and, and in the end annihilation, you know, there is no real answer to, to what it is, but we do know that they are spreading. So there's really nothing like that with the zone. The zone never gets any bigger or anything. It's just the zone. There's six of them. They just, they sometimes mention the other five, but, uh, for the most part, they're, they're not really talked about. So, um, so I feel like annihilation probably took a lot from, uh, from these books, uh, which is great. Um, because I definitely want to read more like this. I like the idea of, uh, an alien race that is just completely unknowable and humans trying to like, you know, some of them trying to understand it, but also some of them trying to, um, understand that understand themselves, I guess, like, you know, just trying to navigate these things and just, you know, in, in annihilation, the, uh, you know, the, the government is fucking falling apart. And at the end of the, the three books, the, the group that's sending scientists in just pretty much collapses due to non-funding because the rest of the world is like at war, like everything else is collapsing around them. And the idea is that the, uh, the zones there are meant to just completely scrub and clean everything, uh, and, and allow it to be you know new again. That's not really here. I mean, it does feel like these zones are just a trash pile, uh, in which, you know, people are going in. They're just like, maybe this, uh, maybe this fixes it. Uh, maybe this is, this battery is supposed to be used for this. Maybe this ring is something, I don't know. I don't know, but we found a use for it. Um, I don't know what it's meant to be used for. So, um, with that, my dog is fucking barking. Of course she is. Um, so, uh, highly recommend it. Um, my next books, I've got uh, Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula D. Uh, Gyun, I want to say. I can never, I, I, I've only ever read her name. I've never heard it pronounced, so I don't know. Uh, I haven't read that since I was in high school. Um, and I've also got another John Scalzi book, which, like the, the latest Old Man's War book. Um, we'll see. I like the Old Man's series, like the first three books, and then it kind of tapered off from there and uh so i don't know we'll we'll i'll blow through it and i'll see what i like about it and if i don't then i'll just uh toss it aside and uh go get something else so uh everybody thank you so much for joining in on the live stream hopefully going to be doing something like this on a fairly regular basis not necessarily about books just you know about news and politics and life and everything uh i'd love to do these with nate but uh right now it's nine o'clock my time which means it's like two in the morning for Nate. So probably not, uh, you know, the, the, the curse of having a, a co-host that lives, uh, on a different continent, but, um, at least you'll get me. And, uh, as long as I put beers inside of me, I will fucking talk until I'm blue in the face. So, uh, thank you all. And, uh, we will talk to you next time.